Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's session. Thank you for taking the time to be here today. Today, we are presenting Leading the Well-Being Revolution, a conversation with Jen Jortner Cassidy. When your employees and students are struggling with burnout, stress, work-life balance, and other life challenges that may impact their performance and productivity, how can we support them? It can feel overwhelming to tackle it all, but it's time for higher education to lead a cultural transformation with well-being and self-care as the foundation for finding work-school-life balance, advancing the outcomes desired by students, faculty, and employees by creating meaningful change is the core of well-being at work, school, and home. And institutional leaders must find the courage to embrace new ways of thinking, unearth assumptions that feed the status quo, and act now. So we're going to go and have a conversation about reconnecting as humans and what we can do in this space today. Uh, but before we get started, I just want to take a few moments to uh, do a little housekeeping. Don't worry, we'll be sending out an on-demand recording of this webinar as soon as it's available, any presentation decks or additional materials will be sent out to you as well. If you have any questions during the presentation, type them into the Q&A box in your Zoom control panel. We'll bring them up during the presentation and we will also have time for questions near the end. I encourage you to sh share what you learn here today. You can always use the hashtag HED leaders as a way to share and get information what we're doing here at HD at, at the Higher Education Leaders uh, webinar. For those of you joining us for the first time, welcome and know that we love hearing from you. Today, the format for the panel is a conversation, a dialogue followed by questions. Now, without further ado, let's hear from Jen. Jen, uh, tell us a little bit about uh, your journey from being a learner to being a learning leader and now incorporating mindfulness. And what, what are your current pursuits and what are you doing right now? Yeah, thanks, Lori, and hello, everyone. It's such an honor to be here. Um, Gosh, I don't, <laughs> I've never referred to myself really as a, as a learning leader. Um, but what I can tell you is that I've always been passionate about learning. And as you know, because we work together, I spent a number of years at lynda.com. And there was, um, there was a period in time where I had, I had been on site with a, a customer and, um, it just, it didn't go well. There was kind of a sense of like this group that I was presenting to, they really didn't have, they weren't really excited about learning. It felt like it wasn't really being encouraged with their organization. Um, they were really kind of almost stressed about it. Like we don't have time, we have too much work to do. And that was really, it was very disheartening to me. And so after that session, I was sitting in a coffee shop and I for whatever reason, just started Googling mindfulness and learning. And I went on this whole associative trail and I discovered that there was actually a master's degree in mindfulness studies at Lesley University. I was like, really? That's, that's kind of cool. You know, mindfulness was starting to become a little bit of a buzzword at that time. And it was right when uh, lynda.com had been acquired by LinkedIn. And I had heard we had this tuition reimbursement benefit. So long story short, I decided to uh, pursue the certificate in mindfulness studies as a way to integrate that knowledge of mindfulness into the realm of learning where I've spent most of my career. Uh, so that's really kind of the uh, long story short version. <laughs> Well, that's great. And so one of the things, because you have this expertise, and because I'd like to sort of set the tone of this meeting, I had this experience about three weeks ago doing our first face-to-face on-site uh, team meeting for the higher education leaders at um, LinkedIn. And we started off with a mindfulness meditation exercise. So I thought it would be great if you could just lead us through a short mindful exercise to sort of show us some of the things that we could do to maybe set our intentions to make this webinar a special day today. Yeah, so I think probably the simplest thing I can do, the most one of the most accessible things that anyone can do is a round of box breathing. So let's actually do two rounds. It'll take about 60 seconds. And so this way that this works is I will cue you to inhale for a count of four breaths. You're gonna briefly hold, 
And then you'll exhale for a count of four breaths and briefly hold. So super simple. Anyone can do this at any time. So if y'all are ready, uh, go ahead and inhale. Two, three, four, hold. And exhale, two, three, four, hold. Inhale, two, three, four, hold. And exhale, two, three, four, hold. Thank you. And that's it. That's You can do that anytime. Like if you're about to go into a stressful meeting or you've just left a stressful meeting, it can really just help you to slow things down to calm the nervous system. That's my favorite form of breath work that's out there. I like it so much better than counting sheep. I mean, when I was a kid, I, I grew up being the baby, being the baby boomer that I am. I mean, that was like what people would tell you to do: count sheep. And I always thought that is the most ridiculous thing. Or <laughs> count the, or do the alphabet backwards. So you revealed to me in our talks that you struggled early on as a learner in college, and this was so hard for me to even imagine knowing what a leader and a learner you've been this past decade in higher education. How did you go from being a learning failure to a learning leader? Mm, yeah, so I, I want to say that I've always loved learning, um, but I very much struggled in the structure of an academic setting. Um, I know this about myself now. I, I don't think I really... Um, allowed it to be present back then, but I'm a person who gets overwhelmed really, really easily. So when I entered my freshman year in college, uh, and this was in the mid nineties, so dating myself a bit, but this was before we had phones buzzing at us all the time. If I wanted to use the internet, I had to go to the computer lab. I think it was Netscape 1.0. It took like an hour for a page to load. So all those distractions of our modern life really weren't present. Um, but what was present was things like living in a dorm for the first time and parties and just the, the workload, the type of work that was required was very different than what I was doing in high school. And I, I got really overwhelmed and really distracted very quickly. Um, spent, you know, to be honest, I spent a lot of time partying and I just kind of disengaged from the academic work. I didn't care. I didn't see the purpose of it. You know, at that time, your freshman year, you're kind of taking some of the basic classes, math classes and things like that. And it, it was upsetting because I knew that my parents it did a lot to pay for me to go to school. And, and I, I just, I did, I felt like a complete failure. Um, one of the things I would do is I would go and hide in the library stacks um, where no one could find me, where it was quiet, where there was no distraction. And I would sit there for, I, I would sometimes study and do work, but for a while I would just sit there doing nothing. And what I know now is it was some form of meditation. I didn't call it, it that then, but I needed to remove myself from the stimulation. And I ended up after my freshman year taking some time off to go work at Disney World. Some of you might be familiar with the Disney College program. And through that, I kind of reconnected with like the purpose of having a career. I really enjoyed the, the work, even though it was working in a retail shop, there were opportunities to kind of shadow managers and leaders and be a manager for a day and, and things like that. There were some business seminars. Um, and so when I, when I came back, I ended up transferring to a different school to UMass Boston, go Beacons. And UMass Boston is really um, designed more for non-traditional students. There's a lot of working adults. It was a very diverse community. And I was able to design my schedule in a way that worked better for me. So instead of the standard five classes, sometimes I was only taking three or four. I would have them all in, in you know, Tuesday and Thursday. So I would have extra time to focus and study. Um, and I wasn't living in a dorm setting, which as fun as it was, it really wasn't good for me academically. I, you know, I don't think your, your, your situation and your experience is so different 
I mean, I think for many, I still am teaching. I teach at University of Southern California and my students say this exactly the same thing with added on all of this technology and all of the craziness that, you know, you get pinged 24 seven about what's going on. And I think, um, you know, I have a kind of a saying when I always say to them, you know, there's no dumb college students. There's just a lot of students with terrible time management skills. I mean, because no one really, you know, going, um, you know, where you're really in an environment that's going 360, 24 seven is really different than being in a high school that has a defined beginning and end, come home to mom and dad, dinner's on the table kind of thing. Um, and I think anybody who's going through a change from one job to the next or one experience to the next has, has had that same thing. We're even sort of dealing with that right now. I was talking to Jen earlier that as we move from working at home to going back to office and to having more face-to-face -face experiences, there's a lot of awkwardness and a lot of feeling uncomfortable and, and trying to figure out, you know, where we belong and how we reconnect. When I, one of the things that struck me is I love the story about the library. When um, I asked you, when did you start practicing mindfulness? You said, you answered, I think I've always meditated. Um, and I kind of have taken that to heart. I've been thinking about it all this last month uh, as I prepared for this webinar. Explain what you mean. What are those moments where we could be meditating or being mindful that we already might do? I want people to know you probably have some sort of survival techniques and sort of self-care techniques that you've already created for yourself. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so one thing, like I think the rise of mindfulness and social media has been a both, both a blessing and a curse. I mean, we have access to tons of great information, um, but also if we, you know, if you look at the hashtag mindfulness on Instagram, it's like all these people sitting peacefully on a mountaintop in Nepal. That's, that's lovely. That's not real life. You know, most of us who try to start a meditation practice at home, we have kids screaming in the background, we have dogs barking, we have cats crawling on our head, like whatever it is. And so we have to remember that we're doing these things in the context of real life. Um, so just simply like the box breathing or taking, if you have five minutes in between meetings, instead of being like, oh my God, I got an email, like walk away from your screen to take a few deep breaths, go outside for a few minutes, look at the sky. Um, one of the things that my husband introduced me to, which I never thought I would view as a mindful activity is splitting firewood. Like there is something so satisfying about splitting firewood and being in the moment or just going through for a walk or doing dishes, but just, just doing dishes, nothing else. Like feeling the warm water, having that satisfaction of like, I just washed a, a, a dish. There are so many opportunities that are right in front of us without saying like, okay, now I need to sit down for 30 minutes to, to meditate. If you can do that, that's great. There's tremendous benefits to that, um, but that's not gonna always be possible. So we have to live in the context of real life. I think that's super important. I think, you know, as, as I told you, for me, I, I try to walk every day. I do have my phone with me, but I don't listen to podcasts. I don't talk to friends or relatives on the phone. I try to be in that moment. And often I'm walking the same route every day, but it's infinitely different every day. And it's really the, you know, I really feel like I can't start my day if I haven't done that walk. It sort of resets me. Um, I've also found as a teacher that I can't always make my students go out and take a walk. I mean, often these Zoom classes or these, these sessions that we're doing with students are, you know, hour, 90 minutes, two hours long. And whether it's face-to-face -face or it's online, we have to sometimes kind of reset. We've, you know, we've poured in all this information, we've done this responsive activity, and then it's really great to just say, in the next five minutes, take five minutes to go reconnect, answer an email, and then zoom back in. Um, it's really, really helpful to remind students to do that. It's, it's, it gets them after a while, I found, just like my walking, when I first started walking, um, and you, I don't know, maybe you have the same story with mindfulness. I only walk two times a week with a girlfriend. Now I walk every single day with or without a friend. So it took a while for me to get into a habit, but the rewards were so great that now if I don't do it, I feel like I've let myself down. I, I don't know if you've had that experience with mindfulness. Like I, I look forward to that experience. So share some of the details of how you picked your mindfulness course of studies. I mean, there must be other programs besides the one you mentioned and what are the requirements and what kind of activities, what kinds of things 
were part of that program. I'm, I'm sure a lot of the people attending today don't even know what that might entail. I mean, we all know what a diversity and inclusion belonging workshop is, and we all know what a short meditation is, but actually the study and practice of mindfulness, we, we may not have a great, great idea of that. Yeah, so um, I, I selected the program, um, you know, I saw this program with Leslie University, and they do a really good job of having these informational sessions. Uh, this was pre-COVID time, so on campus as well as web-based, and I attended I think something on a, a Zoom and then something um, on campus before I made the decision. And what I found, Leslie's relatively small, and I found a really warm and welcoming and supportive community there. I also found that the program encompassed people from many different disciplines. So there were people from, you know, who were therapists, there were lawyers, there were people in law enforcement, there were people in education. So I liked the idea of being part of a program that brought together people from different disciplines, all who wanted to bring mindfulness into, into their work. The other thing I really liked about it was the fact that it was hybrid. So at the time, I was working in a role that required me to travel consistently, and I wouldn't have been able to do a traditional classroom program. So I liked that it was online, but then that also for the certificate, there was a, a week of residency where I had the opportunity to live on campus and be in a classroom and meet my fellow students. And that was just an amazing moment for connection. Um, as far as the program of study, it started with um, some of the foundations of mindfulness from Buddhism. Another misconception is that you have to be Buddhist to meditate or that you know it's gonna be in violation of what, whatever religion you practice or that you have to be religious. No, you don't. Um, and then there was a lot about the science of mindfulness. There was um, mindfulness and conscious action. So you know, bringing it out into the world. But probably the most interesting experience was that this was a three credit class that required us to go on a seven day silent retreat. And maybe by saying this, it'll say like, oh, her life has not been that hard, but this was honest to God, one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, there is no reading, there is no writing. The no only reading time, or writing? Oh no, my God. No reading or writing. Because the idea is you're just, you are completely present with yourself. And that is a really, really hard thing to do. You have two opportunities during this week for talking. One is to do your job. So everyone on the retreat gets a job, which is actually wonderful because that's how they keep it accessible for people. We're essentially running the retreat center. So I was a pot washer and there were two others on my crew and I could talk to them only in the context of like, I'm right behind you. So don't, you know, don't spill hot water on me. It wasn't like small talk, like, oh, hi, how's your day, blah, blah, It was only necessary talking. Um, and then the other context was when you met with a teacher because the teachers want to check in on you and make sure that you're doing okay. And that's around day two. And when it was my opportunity to speak, so you're in a small group, there's one teacher, maybe six students, everyone has an opportunity to speak and check in, but you can't talk to each other. When it was my turn, waterworks, like just uncontrollable crying. And I didn't even know why. Um, and so the teacher suggested that we meet privately and we kind of went through some different things um, and everything kind of started to make sense. And I came out of it such a better person. Um, a friend of mine had said, take a picture of your face before and after. Um, and I was like, that's stupid. No, it like completely, completely, it looked like two different people, to be honest. So by day five or six, where were you at? What was your day like on this retreat? So one of the things that I was doing, which I tend to do for whether it's a vacation or a conference, and I was doing it at the retreat, is if there is a schedule, I will follow the schedule exactly as it's written and I will try to do all the things. So literally the schedule is like sitting meditation, walking meditation, sitting meditation, walking meditation, <laughs> breakfast, and then more of that and then lunch and then more of that and lunch and, and dinner. And then at the end, at, at you know, late, like at seven at night, they do kind of a talk that's more educational. Like that's that's the entertainment. So it's like sit, walk, sit, walk, eat, sit, walk. And I was trying to follow that schedule 
Exactly. I was making it very hectic and I felt a little bit out of control. And when I spoke with the teacher, he said to me, like, you have free will. Like, yes, we give you guidelines, no phones, no reading, no writing, but we're not, we're not whipping you saying, you know, you need to do everything exactly as, as it's written on the schedule. And so what I started doing was I started skipping some of the, you know, the group, the group sitting and walking, et cetera. And I would go for a three mile walk. They had beautiful walking trails at the retreat center. I would go for a three mile walk every day. Um, and I felt like I was moving, getting exercise. I was still being mindful. Um, I also, one thing that really shocked me was I embraced my chore time. So, and this is one of the things I said to the teacher, I was like, my favorite part of the day is washing pots. And he's like, okay, that's okay. I'm like, no, I don't do this at home. I'm a terrible housekeeper. Um, but for me, it was a sense of purpose. It was a sense of making a contribution. So I really embraced that opportunity to wash pots. And then afterwards I would take a nice mindful shower because it was summertime and you get really, really hot and sweaty. Um, and so by the, by day five or six, I started to feel peaceful and I started to get it. And I think I, I was tying it back to in the, like the first two days, I didn't feel a sense of purpose for being there. I was like, I could be home. I could have taken a vacation with my husband. I could be doing things at home. I could be working. I could be doing something, but sometimes we need to pause and take these opportunities so that we can do those things and so that we can do them better. Well, those were really interesting things. And just, we don't all have to go on a mindful retreat for seven days, but I was just thinking how even I sort of set up this framework and I make these rules and I'm on, I'm on the little wheel running as fast as I can. And that, that just that idea, well, you could take something off that, that chart. You could, you could allow yourself to have an experience that you completely control um, that you could, give you could reward yourself in a way that the, the walks became sort of a reward for you just as and then having a sense of purpose what why am i doing what i'm doing i think those are all really good ideas that we could apply even to our normal lives even if we're not on a retreat what what framework have we set up what rules are we telling ourselves we have to follow and do they all matter and can we take the time to see where we can control things that can bring back and enrich us and renew us? And can we do things that make us feel more purposeful? And I think that's a big part of mindfulness that doesn't get talked about as much is it can give us a sense of purpose. And we have an interesting uh, piece of data right now that of when Gen Z people go out to look for work, their number one priority isn't money, it's a sense of purpose at that job before money. Now, boomers like me, we're money. I'm sorry, we're money first. <laughs> um, uh, I think, but it has to do with experience and things like that. But this is, this is a crowd that's come through a lot and a lot of burden. Some, um, I wanna go on to a thing I think is really important. And this is part of the, the whole person, the whole campus idea. Sleep and exercise play a big part in well-being, but it's easy to say, I don't have enough time. Do you have some strategies or tips and tricks to combat this type of thinking and focus on the importance of better sleep and exercise? Yes, and, and through um, some hard, hard lessons learned. Um, I have struggled with sleep all my life and I still am struggling with sleep. So I am a person who, no matter what I've done during the day, 10 p.m. rolls around, I'm like, I'm awake, what are we doing? Let's start doing some work. And, you know, when I was, when I was in an academic setting, when I was, especially when I was struggling, this actually served me well. I'm like, great, I'm an insomniac. I'm going to use this to my advantage. I'm going to stay up all night doing my work, whatever. And as I got older, I, I can't, I can't do it anymore. Like I used to be able to function on two hours of sleep. Like I simply cannot do it anymore. So I, I find it helpful and this is nothing revolutionary, but what do we tend to do before bed? We look at our phones, we watch TV, we do these things that are very overstimulating. Um, and there's loads of things you can read about this. This is not new knowledge, but just trying to shut down at a reasonable time before sleep can be incredibly helpful. Um, I have, you know, your, your, if you have an iPhone, you can set the thing to go off. It sounds like the, one of the children's lullaby is like, this is the, the time to, to wind down so you can get ready for sleep. I have that go off at 9.45 every night. 
Wow. Am I early. always leading <laughs> it to it? No. Well, and 945 is with the intention of getting to sleep at 11, which doesn't always happen. Um, am I always obedient to it? No. But I know that if I'm not, I'm just not going to sleep as well. Um, you know, and I, when I get into bed, I, this is silly, but effective. I have like a little lavender spray I put on my pillow and every night I write in my gratitude journal. That has been such a powerful activity. Write down five things that you're grateful for. And it's more important on the days that have really sucked than it is on the good days. Because even on those days that are awful, you can find like the fact that you have a bed to sleep in, the fact that you have a house to live in, the fact that you have warm socks in the winter, you can find something to be grateful for. Um, as far as other activities that promote well-being, it's going to be a little bit different for everyone, whether it's exercise, meditation, going for a walk, chopping firewood, put it on your schedule. It's so simple, but it's just such a mental thing. If you see on your schedule, like, okay, at 6 a.m., I'm going to go to this yoga class or at 7 a.m., I'm going to meditate or after work when I shut down at, you know, 6 p.m., whatever time it is, I'm going to, I'm going to meditate put it on your schedule. Our lives are ruled by our schedules and by our phones. So doing that has been really effective for me. I do the same. I have a thing called focus time and I put it on my calendar every day. I move it around, but typically yeah. it's in the mornings and I, and I give myself two hours of focus time. I find yeah. for me, I, I kind of, it's not five minutes for me. I need, I need to get, I'm a, I'm a deeper, I have to get deep dive. Yeah. Um, as a follow-up question, how can managers, directors, teachers, et cetera, help the people under their care or watch lead their best possible lives, help them to perform to the best of their ability? Um, it's, it's, it's hard in these times to create environments that help people reach their potential, acknowledge and appreciate them. How do you do that? Give us some tips yeah. on that. Because a lot of us here on this call today have people under our wings. Yeah. 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 So I think, I really think we need to, and I, I feel like the world is going in the right direction here to a degree. Um, we need to move away from a one size fits all approach. Um, so, you know, it's it, like, I, I'm on the East coast in the Eastern time zone. Don't make an assumption that my best working hours are between 8 AM and 5 PM. Honestly, probably going back to this idea of having insomnia, my brain does not really start functioning until about 10, 1030 in the morning. So I may be doing work before that time, but I don't want to have meetings before 1030 AM. Um, but I'm happy to work until 630 or seven, which a lot of people are not happy to do. So that's, that's my rhythm. Um, in an academic setting, you know, again, if you're looking at kind of a typical undergraduate experience, don't assume that five classes is going to work for, for everybody. Or even when I did my graduate degree, I did a two-year program in four years. And at that time, there was a lot of pressure like, no, you can take four classes in a semester and work full time. They're just, no, I can't. Maybe some people can, but, but I can't. And so I think an important question to ask for anyone that is reporting to you or, you know, again, in that academic setting is what are your boundaries? So if you're someone who doesn't function well in the mornings, great. You know, and, and some jobs, it's going to be like if, if you're working in an emergency room and that's your shift, like that's your shift. But, you know, for those who have more flexible jobs working from home, say like, OK, then fine. Block your calendar calendar till 1030 in the morning if, if that's going to serve you. Um, for people who are balancing families, like if your daycare pickup is at 4 p.m., you're not working past 4 p.m. Um, I think understanding and asking that question around boundaries is so important and normalizing that it's okay to have boundaries because if you're able to have boundaries and work in a way that serves you, you're gonna be productive and you're gonna be just more happy with what you're doing. I think it's super important. I, I teach an interaction design class at USC and they work in small teams of three because you're you have a tiebreaker. Um, but one of the things I make them sit down is not only share their schedules, but share the time that they do their most, most productive work. And the schedule is built around finding a common hour once a week outside of class where they can meet, whether it's even for coffee, whether it's just to talk about, yeah, we're all caught up, we're in good shape. Um, 
and you know it was highly highly successful but for some of the groups their time was 11 p.m yeah. <laughs> on thursday night sure. for some of them it was you know um rarely early in the morning i mean it, it was really built around their lives at at the school um how do we best support employees teammate members or students who are struggling um sometimes we see people that are they're they're beyond the beyond we know we need to step in and, and, and intervene what are some suggestions here without being preachy without you know i can i'm i'm a teacher not a doctor i'm a teacher not a psychologist what are your best practices around this idea of how can we intervene or help people around us when you see them really struggling yeah and there's really no easy answer here but i think number one normalization so normalization around the fact that it's okay to not be okay. And there's a whole range of reasons why we might not be okay. You know, on one end of the spectrum, you could have just gone through something very traumatic in your personal life. And so, you know, in your example, as a teacher, maybe you notice a student that just isn't quite themselves or isn't delivering the same quality of work that they had been or isn't engaged. So asking them like, how are you? Are you okay? And giving them the space to share, like, listen, you know, I just went through this really traumatic experience. On the flip side, you could just be really burnt out from doing too much or spending too much time on a screen or getting overwhelmed with the news in the world. And that's a very real thing too. Sometimes we feel guilty for not, you know, well, like I have such a good life. Why am I feeling this way? But from what I understand about mindfulness, and, and I'm not an expert in brain science, but your amygdala does not know the difference. So, you know, you have to really, you have to really pay attention to that. Um, so I think normalization is, is number one. Also, understanding what your limits are as a teacher or a manager. So if someone needs help in a more clinical setting, being aware of those resources where that they can go to get that help because you're not going to be able to help with everything. Um, I often wonder, like, where do the therapists go when, when they need therapy? Um, and also not making assumptions around people. There's a lot of wonderful talk about allyship. Um, you know, there's a lot of, of real positive intention right now of people learning about people who who grew up in different backgrounds than they did but one of the dangerous things i've seen that we have to be really conscious of is making assumptions about people so you know someone might look at me like oh you're a gen x or you must feel this way about x well no i'm jen that i'm an individual human um so i think we have to as we learn about differences, we also have to be very conscious to not say, oh, you fit into this group, whatever it is, racial, sexual orientation, uh, you must feel this way about this. No, ask the individual human with curiosity how they're feeling. I think that's really super important. I think one thing that worked for me in the early days of lynda.com when it was really crazy and really a startup and we'd be getting a lot of things piled on our desk and, and the higher ups would change their mind every two or three weeks. I would do what I call a walk and talk. Hey, would you want to take a 15 minute walk with me and just talk? And I really didn't care what we ended up talking about, but sometimes I'd find out it was something at home. Sometimes I'd find out it was, I've been on this thing for three days, but now they've taken me off. And, you know, it just, it was just a way you know, leave the scene of the accident, <laughs> you know, leaving that scene um, because it gave permission. Um, I find the same is true in the classroom. If it's not a safe, trusted environment, I'm not giving them permission to tell me when something isn't working. Um, they, they should feel that there's no consequence, um, you know, that, that being candid and being honest and authentic don't end up with punitive um, you know, consequences. I think that's really an important thing. At least it has been for me to feel like I can say something and it won't hurt me or the others around me. Um, you know, we live in a really diverse world with diverse teams. And I've picked up from one of our speakers a couple months ago that we all are born with, guess what? Neurodiversity. Our brains are, as what you've just been saying, are as unique and different as each one of us are. And, um, 
I understand building empathy and compassion is important, but as we're not all wired the same, how can we build empathetic and compassionate relationships in our existing workplaces? Yeah, yeah, I think it goes back to that idea of, of not having an environment where it's a one size fits all approach to the degree that's possible. Um, also looking at, at how do individuals, individual people thrive? Uh, so there's tools out there, like I know, um, you know, the team, some of the teams I've worked on, we would do the strengths finder. And that would help the manager to say like, okay, this, this person is really strong in this, but maybe they're not going to get as much energy from doing this type of work. That doesn't mean that something's wrong with them. It just means their strength is going to go in a different area. Um, same thing, like you mentioned in an academic setting, when you, um, when you put students in groups, I love that you're, you know, having them check in around like the times when they have the most energy, but then also looking at like what different skills and strengths can they bring. I remember when I was an undergraduate taking an accounting class and I, I was horrible at it. And there was a group project and I ended up being paired with someone who was really strong in accounting, but had never touched Excel. I was like, great, like I can help you with Excel. You can help me with like the basic fundamentals of accounting. And, and we did, we did great. Um, but I think I love that there's more focus on this concept of neurodiversity right now, um, because this was not something that was normalized when I was growing up. And I'm actually, you know, I'm kind of on a personal journey right now to figure out like, do I have, I'll just say something that needs to be diagnosed. Um, I've gotten to a point where I've said like, I, I'm gonna be okay. If there is a diagnosis, there's a diagnosis. And if, if the diagnosis is burnout, then that's what it is. But if it's something else, then, okay, let me actually address that instead of feeling like I'm not capable of, of doing the job like I did back in my freshman year when I finished with a 1.7 GPA and hid in the library stacks. <laughs> well, I think that just shows how important self-awareness is. I know I've had to learn painfully how important self-awareness is at the workplace just because you feel like it's worked before or you, it works for you, it may not be working for the people around you. And the fact that you're willing to be, there's something wrong here and I have this pattern of behavior, I need to go figure out why. It's really just asking what's the why question here? Why is this occurring? Um, and it's hard, it's really hard for 20 year olds to do this. They're not wired to do that. And part of that is they, this is their first opportunity to be invincible and idealistic. <laughs> They're a part, they have now taken that step away from their family to become an, 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 an autonomous uh, adult. Um, and on our teams, I think we have to think about where people are in their lives too, um, and where they, they are in what they're dealing with. For instance, um, I do a lot of coaching and um, some of our team members had family loss during the COVID period. And, mm -hmm. you know, I say to, I'll say to the manager they're working for, this is not going to impede their job, but temporarily it's having a huge effect, but it doesn't change who they are as a performer. They should be allowed to have the time to grieve. <laughs> we should give them that bandwidth. So I think that's, that's one of the good things. I will agree with you, Jen. We're being more aware of where we need to give bandwidth and where we can pull it in. It's what I call the stretchy timeline. Instead of everything being nine to five, it has to be done and you have to be happy during that period of time and a great worth ethic that we're understanding that people have this, these stretchy timelines that they have to have time to heal, time to grieve, time to, time to think about things, um, to digest. Um, yeah. that's, that's what the, the neuroscientists say that, you know, real learning happens, not just by listening. We all can sit in this webinar and say, yeah, everything Jen said was great. I'm going to go out and do it. But do we go out 48 hours later and do all of these things? Hopefully some of these things that we're talking about today, you will. That's called the digestion part. That's when your brain says, oh, we're doing this again. And the brain goes, I guess it's really important. Laura's saying, we're going to do this again. And that's what happened with me with walking. It sounds like to me, that's what's happened with you with mindfulness. It's really now integrated into your life. It isn't something you have to add to the calendar even in that same way. I love that you shared, cut out the nonsense. She said this to me in one of our meetings. <laughs> Explain the importance of doing this and how it can impact and bring greater meaning in your life. And I, 
I say that in all capital letters, cut out the nonsense. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I love that you did that. So I, I think in our personal lives, um, you know, and, and I don't want to, I don't want to generalize, but I do see this with a lot of women, with a lot of, of friends of mine and with myself, we will make impossibly long to-do lists. Like we have to do all these things, right? And I've tried to um, kind of embrace this um, concept of the bucket. And the bucket, it, it starts with a, uh, yeah, I got one too right next to me. It starts with a four letter word that rhymes with duck. Um, sometimes you just need to put things in the bucket and say, I am not going to do this. Um, when I was doing my mindfulness certificate and I, I had a paper to write and it was really intense, the dishes in my sink were this high. I actually wrote an article about it on LinkedIn. It's just like, you know what? I got to let that go. That's not going to happen. And I think during COVID, we're all like stuck at home. I'm like, I should really clean out that closet. And I was like, I now have the time to clean out that closet. You know what? I don't actually care if the closet is clean. So I'm just going to let it be a mess. And I'm going to be okay with that. And I think too, in the workplace, sometimes we get this is probably above my level, but you know, when, when we all stopped going into offices and we were working from home, I think probably a lot of leaders and organizations were like, we have to keep people engaged. And these different things to do kept getting piled on, um, different processes and just like overcomplicated ways of doing things. I think we have to take a step back from just having these types of things that make our jobs harder. Um, to me, I want to tie everything to purpose. So if it's really, for example, if it's really challenging for me to file an expense report because of the system or you have to put in all these codes or and maybe the accountants would argue with me, how can we make that simpler so that we can get back to focusing on the activities of our jobs that give us a sense of purpose? Or you know what, like how do we make things project-based so you know, maybe some weeks you're working 40 or 50 hours, but then when that's done, the next week you're working 20 or 30. I think we're stuck a little bit in the whatever industrial revolution of like people need to be tied to work for this many hours to be considered full time. There's been a lot of talk about this, but maybe we need to redefine what that concept of full time work looks like. I think that's really important. I call this the Mount Everest problem. You know, nobody's ever climbed Mount Everest alone and nobody's yeah. ever done it in one day. <laughs> and so creating like breaking down these big projects or these overwhelming tasks or responsibilities into baby steps. What do I yeah. need to do today? Yeah. Um, is there, can I only do this three times a week? I don't take out my trash every day. You know, like how can I, how can I break this up into a way that's a pattern for me that I can live with that makes me feel. Um, another thing that's really important is like um, giving yourself rewards. For you, that walk was a reward that mm -hmm. you could, I have a choice to go off schedule and pick an activity that I wanna do. Um, maybe it's going and getting your Phil's mojito or maybe it's you know walking with your dog or watching a game that your kids are in. I think mm -hmm. all of those are really important. I talk a lot with my students about giving yourself reward when you've accomplished one of those baby steps to get to the big end. You know, mm -hmm. there's, it doesn't have to be grueling. Um, so we're getting almost to the questions, but I've got one more. It's about technology. I can't help not talk about it. It's the elephant in the room in terms of mindfulness. In some ways, perhaps technology is the biggest culprit in attacking our well-being. Share your thoughts on wrestling with the ever-present invasion of technology on us. And I'll just give you one example. One day I was teaching at graduate students and in the chat feed, I saw that Ruth, uh, that the Supreme Court Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg had died and it has nothing to do with what I teach. So my feed was becoming a news channel in my class. Mm -hmm. This is, I'm sure happened to everybody that while they're in a Zoom meeting, something else has appeared in the feed because somebody got pinged and now it's, it's now a part of that. It's very invasive. It's good and it's bad. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think yeah. there's a lot of bad. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No. I mean, I've I've struggled with this greatly. Um, 
I'm going to do a plug. So I think many of us have heard of the documentary, The Social Dilemma, which is very good. The Center for Humane Technology, who put that out, they have a podcast that is very eye-opening that I would highly recommend. Um, essentially, there's a lot of misconception that we as adults, and even more so, you know, if you're a parent, need to be in control of how much we engage with, with our phones and with social media and with all these things. And that's true to a degree. But if you listen to this podcast, you begin to understand that these mechanisms, these algorithms are designed to be highly addictive. They're designed to keep you engaged for hours and hours and hours on, on end. And so similar to any addiction that one might have, at some point you are no longer in control. And, and it's actually, it's, it's quite terrifying. Um, so I, I think we have to, look at these things with balance and intention. Um, I know people who have completely deleted Facebook. I'm not gonna take that step because there's a lot of good for me personally in Facebook. There's groups I belong to, there's family that I'm able to keep in touch with that I really don't have another way to keep in touch with them because they're in a different country or you know, at least it's not easy. Um, I do enjoy interacting with people on, on Facebook with purpose, however, I do not have Facebook on my phone. I check it once or twice a week on my computer. I get what I need, or if you know, there's a group in the town where I live, if I need a pet sitter or a plumber or something like that, that's great. And then that's it, I don't have it on my phone. Other things, on, especially on my phone, my notifications are shut off. The only thing I get notified on is if it's a phone call and a voicemail, a, a calendar thing, like I need to be somewhere or a text message. Everything else, the notifications are are shut off. Um, YouTube, you know, for normally it goes to the next video. I shut that off too. And it's not to say that I'm perfect at this. That I, you know, the other night we, my husband and I discovered we could play YouTube on our new TV that we just bought. We said, this is very much a violation of everything I've told you, but we've sat there until 1130 at night watching bad lip reading, which is hilarious if you haven't seen it over and over and over again, we got sucked into it. Netflix says the same thing. Um, and I don't want to put down any of these platforms because there is good to all of them. But when the people who are designing these things are measured on engagement, and measured on the time spent on the platform, they're gonna design things in a way that encourages that. And that's what this podcast talks about it. So there are these small things like just changing the default configuration and shutting off the notifications that can allow us to be more in control. And we all do this, I do it, again, not perfect, but if you pick up your phone, why are you doing that? Why are you picking up your phone right now? We just do it so automatically. It's like the new, it's like the new cigarettes, right? Like, you know, back in the day, you're sitting in a bar having a drink, you pick up a cigarette. Like, why are you picking up your phone? Ask yourself that every time you do it. I think that's really funny. In one of my classes, I teach a data visualization class. I asked them to write down what they did in a uh, typical day with technology. And one of my students came back to me and said, it takes up more than 24 hours, Lori. I said, that's the problem. <laughs> um, that the, those activities are, are that dominant. So Anna, I'd like to see if there's any questions from the uh, attendees that we could answer and have Jen respond to them. Sure, we don't have too many yet. Um, just one question here. Um, if you could please clarify the name of the podcast once more. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So it's put out by the Center for Humane Technology, and the podcast itself is called uh, Your Undivided Attention. Perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, and then also, I was, I was curious, too, I was really fascinated with your story about the wellness retreat. And I was just curious what the biggest challenge was as you started to step back into your daily routines after the retreat. And, and how you managed to carry forward the lessons and practices learned. Yeah, so one thing I know now, because I have done other not quite that intense or that long retreats uh, since that first one, and someone on the retreat, when we were allowed to talk at the end, gave me this tip, 
take a vacation after, even if it's like a staycation, don't go straight back into work, which, you know, you might feel like, well, I've already taken seven days for a retreat. How am I going to do that? But I was back at, I think I had like, you know, I got home on a Saturday, I had Sunday, and then I was back at work on Monday and I had about 500 emails and like, I, I did not know what I couldn't function. Like I was sitting there, like just staring at my screen, like, what do I do? Um, so that, that is something I would recommend if possible. And then just, I think with any experience, whether it's a retreat or even like if you go on a vacation in a different country and you fall in love with something about that culture, like take that back with you. So when I went to Australia years ago, Australia is a big coffee culture and I love coffee and it's all espresso. I bought an espresso machine. Like I wanted to have espresso every day. Same one thing with the retreat. There was lots of those periods of walking meditation and walking meditation, viewing it from afar, it always kind of freaked me out. It just looked like these zombies, like just walking really slow back and forth on a path. Um, but one of the things that happened on the retreat that I didn't expect is I was in a lot of physical discomfort because it's also a lot of sitting. My back was hurting, my neck, my shoulders were hurting. The walking meditation really kind of saved me. And that's something I do now just kind of every day at lunchtime, or if I have five minutes between meetings, I will do a quick walking meditation which is still meditation. You're just walking back and forth really slowly on a path. And I absolutely fell in love with that. Any more, Anna? Thanks so much, Jen. I'm not seeing any additional questions Good. at this well, we're time. Getting, we're getting close to the top of the hour. Just a shameless plug for LinkedIn Learning. We have a number of courses on uh, LinkedIn Learning and well-being and self-care. It's one of the most popular topics, trends that was going on during the COVID and pandemic, and it still continues to be one in the top 10, 10 requests of people. Um, we also, I wanted to let you know that we're celebrating across the country a mental uh, health, wellness, and being the entire so being aware of this at your own wherever you are and whatever job whatever role you have and uh thinking about the things that you can do so um before i tell you about what we're going to be doing next week um jen I, there's one more thing i'd like you to explain there's something that i've learned from you that you call setting an, an intention could you tell us how we can do that and maybe how we can do that for today yeah absolutely so you know hopefully i've I've given you a lot of things to think about, right? Um, and I think it's important after something like this, after any kind of webinar or, or class that you go to, take a few moments and just pick out one or two things, not all the things, but pick out one or two things like, oh, this could really work for me and adapt it to you. And then kind of on a, you know, a lot of people like to set goals at the start of the year, resolutions, whatever. Pick one thing, whether you do it, you know, once a month or once a day, like pick one thing that's important in that time period. So quick shameless plug, like I, at the start of the year, I was like, you know what? I love offering guided meditation. I'm gonna start doing that on LinkedIn Live. I'm gonna push myself out of my comfort zone. Um, and so that's something I've been doing and I really enjoy it. Sometimes I have like one person, sometimes I have, you know, 10 or 12. So I'm not getting like a huge audience with it, but it's something I really enjoy doing. And I, I really, I try to each day say like, okay, if there's nothing else for today, I'm gonna do this one thing. Um, so just, start small. Don't try to do all the things. The last thing I want to do by offering this to you is, is create any sense of overwhelm. <laughs> well, just to let you know, I've taken advantage of those. And some days I'm there when you're live. And some days I watch just the recording and I'm there with you, whether you realize it or not, uh, in, in that space after the fact. I, I find it, um, it for me, uh, it's, it's a nice stop for the day and it doesn't take a lot of my time. So thank you so much for Jen. Jen, for sharing all that you have been through, all that you've learned, what this journey's like, and giving us so many tips and strategies. It's really, really helpful. And all of you that attended today, thank you. We hope to see you next time at the Higher Education Leaders event on June 16th, 10 a.m. Pacific time, 1 p.m. Eastern time. It's many locations, one community, women in tech at the University of California with Allison Flick from UCSD, 
Anna Lee Rugg from UCLA and Yvonne Tevis from the University of California Office of the President. They were recent authors of an Educause Review article on building community for women in tech. They're going to reflect on how their UC Women in Technology Committee got started, gained traction, and is getting great results. And it's really not just an ERG, but it's really about a community, a really supportive community for women in technology to have mobility to talk about issues that are important to them. They have a model that's worked for them at the, UC, at the UC campuses, and there are a lot of them and a lot of those women. And they want to share that model with all of us and give us some hints on how we could start that at our own community, at our own university, or in our own university system. So I want to leave you with one other thing. You can always find any of the past recordings on the, the uh, website, highereducationleaders.splash.com. And I want to let you know that every one of these uh, webinars is a really interesting thing. I actually have gone back and revisited many of them and listened to them again. I hope that you find these resources helpful and we try to come up with the best trends, the best ideas. Again, Jen, thank you so much for being here today. And with that said, I'm gonna give that a wrap to everyone today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Lori. Thanks everyone.